we are so happy to be hosting the fourth Hartman Institute lecture of the Manhattan Community Collaborative. This week, in our Torah portion cycle, Bo, we get a taste of redemption as the final of the plagues are brought down on Pharaoh and the Israelites are allowed to leave Egypt. They quickly get their things together and they leave Egypt as an Erev Rav, a mixed multitude. We are still a mixed multitude here tonight. We represent every denomination in Jewish life, different sides of the political spectrum, different ages, and I suspect very different politics when it comes to Israel. But we're all united in our desire to engage in the conversation about Israel that is informed and nuanced and challenging. We want to dig into the complexities and understand that there can be multiple narratives that speak truth. I really feel the power of being in a room full of people who are lovers of Israel. Even with all our differences, even with our struggle to understand what our relationship to Israel will be and how we might be able to shape the dialogue. I can't remember another time since I've moved to New York City over a decade ago where the whole Jewish community has come together across the spectrum like this for a civil conversation on probably the most contentious issue in the Jewish community. In my mind, this is a little taste of redemption. I think the Shalom Hartman Institute was exactly the group to pull this little miracle off. At Central, we've had over 150 students who've taken Hartman's I Engage Israel curriculum, who've been able to ground their Israel dialogue and conversation in Jewish values and with a depth of knowledge rather than just sound bites. Hartman really understands how intellectual inquiry and the power of ideas can change the Jewish landscape. They also know the power of partnership. So we are grateful also to the UJA Federation of New York for helping bring this larger Jewish community together through our shared values and to the Legacy Heritage Fund for its support of this series. I also want to name and thank the other synagogues and community centers who are making this program happen. B'nai Jeshurun, Congregation Anshe Chesed, Congregation Kehilat Jeshurun, Congregation Road of Shalom, Congregation Shari Tzedek, JCC of Manhattan, Kihilat Reim Ahuvim, Park Avenue Synagogue, Romamu, Society for the Advancement of Judaism, Sutton Place Synagogue, Temple Israel, the City of New York, the Temple Emmanuel Skirball Center, West End Synagogue. It's an impressive list, and Central is very proud to be part of that mixed multitude. And now it's my honor to welcome Daniel Septimus to the BIMA. Daniel is the executive director of Safaria, which is the online living library of Jewish texts, and he's the former editor-in-chief of myjewishlearning.com. I would say Daniel is my biggest luminary I know in the online Jewish learning world. And also, I consider him a friend, and I'm really pleased to invite him up tonight. He will be in introducing our speaker. If you want to be a luminary, pick a really small niche, <laughs> go for it. Um, so I'm just here to tell you the, the format of the evening, uh, and then I'm going to uh, turn it over to Alana. Uh, so Alana will speak for about 60 minutes. Uh, at the conclusions, we'll have people picking up uh, question cards, or I guess giving out question cards and picking up those questions, and then those will come up to me and we'll have a, a period of, of, of Q&A. Um, Alana, your bio. It's in here, everyone, if you want to read the whole thing, but I'll read the first paragraph for you. Alana Steinhain is the Director of Leadership Education for the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America, where she serves as a lead faculty member and oversees the content of lay and professional leadership programs. Uh, more importantly for me, uh, she's on the board of directors of Safaria, and I'll tell you that when uh, the very small board, there were I think five people before she came on, um, when they got together to think about an next board member, what they were really trying to think about, because this is a project that thinks about digital Torah and what the shape of Torah might look like in the future, 
uh, they really wanted to find someone who they thought represented not just great education today, uh, but really what does the future of Torah look like? Uh, and they invited Alana Steinhain. So uh, I think you will all enjoy learning from her tonight. That is a great intro, Daniel. Thank you. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I'm humbled to be at Central Synagogue with Rabbi Bookdahl. We have such a wonderful Hartman, um, Hartman Bookdahl relationship, we might say. Um, and it, it, when we say we believe in partnership, we really mean it, and it means a lot to us. So thank you very, very much. A lot of people have to work to pull something like this off, and I want to thank my colleagues at the Shalom Hartman Institute for what they've done to pull tonight's event off. Um, whether or not a State of the Union address is going to happen a little bit later, try not to think about that for the next... 75 minutes or so. And I also want to thank Daniel for being here. We really appreciate it. And lastly, I want to thank all of you because we can't have a communal conversation without the community. So it means a lot that people are willing to come out and trust us to put some ideas out on the table so that we can start important conversations. It's great to see familiar faces and it's great to see new faces. And I continue to hope that more and more of you will keep coming because we see the impact that what we're doing is having on the Jewish community, and we hope to see it grow. I want to dedicate my remarks tonight to uh, my late aunt, Dina Brilliant, of blessed memory. She passed away um, just a few months ago, and she lived in Ranana, Israel. She was a proud Zionist, and she was proud of her family, and I'm sure that it's meaningful to my father, her brother, and my mother, her sister-in-law sitting here tonight, when I think about how my first opinions of Israel were shaped, I think about trips to visit my Aunt Dina and trips that Aunt Dina made here. So I hope that what I have to say tonight is a merit to her memory. In his famous epic, Ulysses, the Irish writer James Joyce records a precious, precious scene. Leopold, the main character of the book, is described as a young boy, quite rambunctious. And one afternoon, he walks into his family's home looking rather disheveled. He has bruises and cuts. His clothing is all sullied. And of course, he's greeted by his father with the following excla exclamation. Mud, head to foot, cut your hand open. They make you kaput, Leopold. You watch them chaps. The young boy offers his explanation. But they challenged me to a sprint. It was muddy. I slipped. His father sighs at his son's innocence and adds with contempt, Goyim naches. Nice spectacle for your poor mother. In this scene, Leopold's father characterizes playing in the mud, physical competition itself, as the pride of the Gentile not the pride of a nice Jewish boy. Forget the fact that Leopold had converted to Protestantism himself. He still had a sense that Yiddish anachis, Jewish pride, was something brainier, more docile. Indeed, the notion of Jewish pride or nachis was a central feature of the Jewish imagination for hundreds of years. And the idea of what Yiddish nachis meant was usually what your kid brought home, what your kid was able to do. With the advent of Zionism, all of that changed. Max Nordau, who was the co-founder of the World Zionist Organization, coined the term muscular Judaism. To him, muscular Judaism meant a Jew who was strong, a Jew who could participate in the fiercest competition, a Jew who could defend himself or herself. Would that override notions of the classical Yiddish Anachis? For some, it would. Indeed, it would take its place. While for others, they tried to hold the two in tandem. Today, I really believe we find ourselves at another pivotal moment of questioning what Yiddish Anachis means, what pride, what satisfaction means, 
And when I talk about this pride, I mean in relation to the state of Israel. We started this series a few months ago at this point, talking about what narratives shape our view of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that's a very personal question. We moved on to the more philosophically abstract questions of what values do we hold dearest or what mixture of values do we hold dear when we think about the conflict? How do we pride self-preservation, for example, as a moral in comparison with others? What do we think about compromise or justice? Tonight, I'd like to bring us back to the personal. I'd like to talk about nachas, about pride, about the role that pride plays in the way that we understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And let's be clear, nachas is not cognitive. It speaks to emotional attachment. It's visceral. It's felt in one's whole being. When I feel proud, I show it even in my posture, a straightened back, head tilted high, a contented smile. Pride isn't taught, it's internalized. Nachis is essential to identity. Pride is about the way we view ourselves. It's about the way we think others view us. But the causal relationship between pride and identity is far from clear and it's often inconsistent. Do I choose to be proud of something because I already identify with it? Or do I choose to identify with it because I find that it's worthy of my pride? With my children, for example, do I think my child is the cutest kid on the playground because he's mine? Or do I feel pride when my child achieves something and I want to say, that's my child? This is a critical question for American Jews and Zionism today. Do we identify as Zionists because we are proud of the way that the state of Israel comports itself and what it is? Or are we already identified with the state of Israel and therefore we seek to understand its actions and to be proud and to read them in the most charitable light. I think we're at a critical juncture in this question. For much of the 20th century, most of the 20th century, Israel was a source of pride that could unite Jews in North America. Someone told me the story tonight that she was actually trying to get into a synagogue. This is your worst nightmare. Trying to get into a synagogue and there was a code on the door. She didn't know the code, but she really wanted to get in. So she tried 1836, high, double high. And then she tried 1948, boop, open the door. If that's your code, you should change it tonight. Pride in Israel was what Jewish identity could be forged around. But for some in this audience, this is not news. For others, this is very disheartening news. Today, many Jews are troubled by the notion of identifying with Israel, and they're even troubled by identifying with Jewishness because they simply don't feel nachis from it. First, even without judgment about the conflict, without any assignment of blame, just the fact that the conflict seems so intractable, that confrontation, violence, and suffering seem so inescapable, People simply don't like how Israel reflects on their own personal identity. They'd rather not be saddled by this incredibly complex issue. And all of this is prior to arguments between right and left about judging Israel's actions in a positive or in a negative light. For many, even those who are very committed to the state of Israel, their assessment of Israel's actions themselves are no longer a source of pride. So this is a moment of pivot and transition. I'd like to figure out with you, I'd like to think aloud with you about what role Nachas plays in the way we read the conflict, and just as importantly, what role pride can play in creating and cementing a strong relationship between members of our own community and between our communities and the state of Israel. From where I sit, 
Pride is relevant to how we think and talk about the conflict, mainly in two ways. These two senses of pride that we're going to look at tonight, we'll analyze them. They're not uncontroversial, but they're very much a part of our conversation. They contribute heavily to the tension that we feel and the vitriol that's expressed in the way we talk about the conflict within our own communities. The first sense of pride I call pride instead of shame. You can also call it pride of accomplishment, but I think pride instead of shame really captures it in an important way. Pride instead of shame is about history. It's about memory. It's about the long view of Jewish suffering and success. The great Jewish historian Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi of blessed memory, who I was blessed to have as a teacher, famously argued that for centuries, the idea of a Jewish historian simply didn't exist. Jews looked to the Bible in order to understand what they were going through. So every new villain, every new oppressor, every new enemy was the new Haman or the new Pharaoh. And every new court Jew, every new hero of the Jewish people was the new Mordechai or the new Esther or the new Moses. Why did they choose this framework? Simple, because the evil you know is more comfortable than the evil you don't. By looking to the biblical examples of oppression and redemption, they said to themselves, you know, we've seen this before and we've survived this. We've been saved from this. And what we're going through now isn't that different and we'll survive it again. Today, we live in a world where Jewish historical scholarship is incredibly popular and there aren't even enough jobs to go around. Nonetheless, there are still reasons to be looking to our sacred scripture and even applying it as a lens to what we see today. In addition to the metaphysical narrative that it presents and the religious import, there's psychological and social import into looking at how we've dealt with trauma before, how we've dealt with challenge in the past. And it's for that reason, in order to understand what I'm calling pride instead of shame, I'd like to take you back to what I think it might be one of the first critical moments in Zionism, to use an anachronism. It's the moment where Joshua, the successor to Moses, who had passed away, is taking the Israelites into Canaan, is taking the Jews into the promised land for the very first time. They've just crossed over the Jordan River and before they can go on with their conquest, they're given a ritual directive. If everyone could open to page five on their sheets, we can take a look at this together. Have I offended anyone yet? If you don't say no, I'm taking that as a yes. Number one, I'm gonna keep asking, so get ready. Number one, Joshua 5. It's source number one on page five. And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan westward and all the kings of the Canaanites that were by the sea heard how God had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until they were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. So people were scared. The indigenous inhabitants were scared. At that time, God said to Joshua, make knives of flint, not to fight, but, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Now, anyone who reads the word circumcise again should be a bit wary. Circumcise again the second time. When was the first time? And what do we mean by a second time? Why a second time? Verse three, and Joshua made knives of flint and circumcised the children of Israel at Givat Ha'aralot, the hill of the foreskins, literally. No one is going to forget this. I will say, I think that every parent at their child's circumcision would like to name that place the hill of the foreskins, right? The trauma of that. The hill of the foreskins. And this is why, though, now we're going to get an understanding of why this is such an important moment. What's the second 
piece here, why call the name after this moment of circumcision, and this is why Joshua did circumcise all the people who came out of Egypt that were males. Few. Even all the men of war died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Well, first of all, you should know that all the men who lived before, they're dead. For all the people that came out, they were already circumcised, verse 5. But all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came out of Egypt, had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the nation, even the men of war that came out of Egypt, were consumed because they hearkened not unto the voice of God, unto whom God swore that God would not let them see the land which God swore unto their fathers that God would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. And God raised up their children in their stead. This is the second time, not because it's these people's second time at circumcision, but because they are the second generation. They are a new reflection, a second covenant to their parents' lost covenant. Joshua circumcised them for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And it came to pass when all the nation were circumcised, every one of them, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole, until they were healed, that is. At this moment, this group of people is not being looked at on its own. This group of people is being looked at in relation to those who came before them. And in verse 9, that's where the essential psychological drama happens. And God said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the shame of Egypt off you. Hayom galoti et cherpat Mitzrayim me'alechem. Wherefore, the name of that place was called Gilgal, rolling unto this day. This is a moment of replacing shame with pride. For the people who found their way into the promised land, they weren't starting with a clean slate, with a tabula rasa. They were being entrusted to fulfill the dashed hopes and dreams of their ancestors who never made it to the promised land. And so Joshua is told that it is time to renew the covenant with the next generation to circumcise them so that they may perform the Passover ritual, which they do in the following verse, the same Passover sacrifice that their circumcised parents before them performed the night of their exodus from Egypt. But they sojourned in a wilderness that they would never be released from. This is the moment that God asserts will rid them of their shame. Do something that you could not do before. Circumcise yourselves in this land because you could not do so on the way because of enemies and danger. Eat your Passover, not running from your slave master. Eat your Passover as masters of your own fate. Fast forward to today. Not such an unfamiliar notion. Many who are committed to the land of Israel, to the state of Israel, to Zionism, they do not live in a historical vacuum. They do not start with a clean slate, with a tabula rasa. They recognize that we are entrusted with fulfilling the dashed hopes and dreams of our ancestors. We as a people have had to bear so much shame, so much trauma, so much hurt and tragedy over the millennia of Jewish history and the Holocaust brings about the most acute and recent feeling of that shame and that trauma. Not only or not at all because of something we did, but because of something we weren't able to do. We could not defend ourselves. We could not escape. We simply did not have the means. We rebelled, but it wasn't enough to set us free. It wasn't enough to save our, save our loved ones. And the world turned a blind eye. There were righteous Gentiles, there weren't enough of them. In addition to physical violence and decimation, there is deep shame felt by a people who cannot but watch their loved ones die. 
their families destroyed, their communities rent asunder. I want you to contrast that feeling of shame with the feeling of pride felt at actually being able to defend ourselves, at being able to have a state dedicated to the protection of the Jewish people, even when no one else protects us. This is a second covenant. It is eating a Paschal lamb not in fear of slave masters, but as strong and proud soldiers. This is Goyesh Anachis that has become Yiddish Anachis. This is the pride felt after the War of Independence. This is the pride of the Six Day War. This is the pride of Iron Dome. It's the pride of the dog tag that you have at home or the bullet that you bought for your little kid. It's the pride felt at seeing a soldier with a Jewish star on her lapel. Do soldiers have lapel? No one knows. That's the pride. This pride is dominant for so many when thinking about the conflict. Thank God we can defend ourselves. But I have to say, this pride is not uncontroversial. For some, this sense of pride has no place. Their view is much more focused on the present. It's not that people are not happy or glad or relieved that Jews can defend themselves, but they are concerned that something more than self-defense may be happening. Still others are simply discomfited by the association between Jews and victimhood. When these Jews read this text in Joshua, they realize that the words Today I have rolled back the shame of Egypt. Hayom galoti et cherpat mitzrayim me'alechem. Have incredible power. These new Israelites in the time of Joshua who could have thought of themselves as free of the shame of Egypt will actually forever associate their own covenant of strength to their prior victimhood. Many Jews today ask, why think about the state of Israel as representing Jews in the concentration camp? This casts Jews as victims. Why do we always need to think of ourselves as the victims of history, an image which makes power all important? Seeing Jews as victims is alienating because it's inconsistent with their own experience as citizens of the Western world. What's more, casting Israel as a victim, even as Israel has incredible military might and resources, is an issue for them. The message of persecution against Jews throughout history is not about being victimized as much as it's about not victimizing others. As I read in one young rabbi's sermon, I have never seen Israel as a David. I have only seen it as a Goliath. And so this source of pride for some is a source of alienation and resentment for others. How is it possible for some of us to feel proud while others feel resentful and outraged? How is it possible for these feelings to coexist? After all, this is about Jewish identity. It's about what we are, how we want to express ourselves, and what we want to be. I call the second application of pride in reading the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, pride by comparison or differing standards. Pride by comparison is about how to measure success. What standards need the state of Israel meet in this conflict in order to make me proud, in order to make me want to identify as a Zionist? Need Israel's handling of the conflict be flawless or need it merely meet certain standards? And if so, which standards, whose standards? This question is actually addressed beautifully by the rabbis in the way that they read what I might call the very first instance of pride in the Jewish canon. It's not an instance of human pride. It is, as it were, an instance of divine pride. The coda of the Torah's creation story can be found on page seven, number three. Vayar Elohim et kol asher asa, and God saw everything that God had made, 
Vihine tov me'od. And behold, it was very good. Vayihi erev, vayihi voker, yom hashishi. And it was evening, and it was morning, it was the sixth day. The world is very good, deems God. But by whose standards? Some suggest that the implication is that the world must have been perfect. In fact, the rabbis commenting specifically on the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Kohelet, which is a book that ruminates on the purpose of life and what our existence is all about, they assume, at least in one passage, that perfection is what's meant here. On number four, on page seven, Kohelet Rabbah, the rabbinic midrash, the rabbinic homily on Ecclesiastes. Commenting on a verse in Ecclesiastes, he has made everything beautiful in its time. The rabbis connect this to the creation of the world. Rabbi Tanchuma said, the world was created in its time. It should not have been created any earlier. Rabbi Abahu said, I'd prefer to focus on something else. This implies that God would build worlds and destroy them. Build worlds and destroy them until God created these, that is the world that we live in, and said, these are pleasurable to me while those were not. Dain hanayan li yaton, uh, Dain hanayan li, excuse me, yaton lo hanayan li. This is a standard that we can't meet. We all know people who set standards that no one can meet. But I don't think this is the conversation that we're having between right and left in our communities. No one is expecting Israel to be flawless, to be perfect. However, there is another understanding of what tov me'od, very good, means. And that's suggested by the rabbis in their homily on Bereshit, on Genesis itself. If you turn with me to page eight, you'll see a very different type of goodness asserted. Now, the nice thing about reading in English as opposed to Hebrew, is that sometimes you get really great moments, like Rabbi Simon said, which I'd rather, you know, it would be better if it was in present tense, but it's pretty good. Rabbi Simon said. When God chose to create the first human being, the ministering angels took sides. Some said, God shouldn't create, while others said God should create. This is what's meant by the verse in Psalms, kindness and truth confronted each other, righteousness and peace kissed. Kindness argued as a platonic virtue, of course. God should create humans. They do kindness, while truth says God shouldn't create humans. They're liars. Righteousness, or perhaps justice, argued God should create humans. They commit acts of righteousness and justice. While peace argues God should not create humans. All they do is quarrel. So what did the Holy One do? God picked up truth and threw it to the ground. Has anyone seen um, the picture of School of Athens? That famous painting of all of the brilliant Greek thinkers you can think of. And in the center of the, of, of the picture is Plato pointing upwards and Aristotle pointing downwards. Plato's idea of the platonic virtues up there in the ether and Aristotle's understanding of the rational God and the way that we behave. There is a moment here where God throws the platonic truth down to the Aristotelian reality. God picked up truth and threw it to the ground. This is what is meant by the verse in Daniel. Daniel, we knew we'd get you in here somehow. And it cast down truth to the ground. 
The ministering angel said before God, Master of worlds, why do you scorn your royal seal of truth? After all, the rabbis taught, Chotamo shel hakadosh baruch hu emet. God's seal is truth. Let truth rise from the earth, is God's response. This is what is meant by the verse in Psalms, truth shall sprout forth from the earth. The rabbis said this in the name of Rabbi Hanina, son of Idi, and Rabbi Pinchas, and Rabbi Chilkia, in the name of Rabbi Simon. Let's talk about the wording here. The word is vihine tov me'od. And behold, it was very good. Well, you know, the word very, me'od, is an anagram for the word adam, human being. This is what is meant, and God, by God saw all that God had done, and behold, it was very good, tov me'od. Behold, the human being was good. The great Rav Huna of Sepphoris says, while the ministering angels continued to agitate over this, God created the human being. God said to them, what are you deliberating about? Humanity has already been created. What a metaphor for the way we argue over the state of Israel. As we deliberate, a state pulsates with life, people go about their regular day, and we deliberate over these questions. But moreover, what's fascinating about this Midrash is that it talks about truth and goodness and perfection in human terms, it's all relative to what human beings can do. And while people really like to paint the arguments between right and left as, you know, the left, there are a bunch of perfectionists and it has to be absolute perfection. And the right, they have no standards. They don't think critically. I don't think that's what's happening. I think the question is, what are the standards that we're judging by? What are we comparing? To what? Let's not end with a preposition. To what are we comparing the state of Israel? Many among us look at the state of Israel and naturally and immediately compare it to other countries that have experienced trauma, to other countries beset by terrorism, to other countries in the Middle East, and we look and we have a sense of pride by comparison. Look at how moral Israel's army is. Look at the goodness of its people. Look at its democratic principles. Look at the hope that's unyielding for peace and reconciliation. Others of us make a different comparison altogether. We compare Israel to democracies that are not in trauma. We compare Israel to democratic values, progressive Western values like equality and freedom. And we look at the conflict and we see racial inequality and we see poverty and we see prejudice and we see a cycle of never ending violence that does not fill us with pride. How is it possible that people in this very room are looking at the very same facts and through that different comparative lens are feeling literally opposite feelings? literally opposite feelings. How do we handle that? And I have to say that I am not content to just live with this controversy. It's ugly. And I think it threatens the future of Zionism among North American Jews. It threatens not only the dissolution of our Jewish community and unity, but it threatens Israel ultimately. Trying to figure out what Yiddish Anachis is today is actually essential because there are people who look and say, ah, Nachis. And there are people who say, I don't even want to be associated with that. You know, when I thought about the title for this evening's talk, commitment and complexity came very, very easily to mind. And I want to talk about complexity for a moment. I want to talk about how difficult it is for people, for institutions especially, to hold complex narratives. Another one of the teachers that I was blessed to have is the late Rebbe Yehuda Amital of blessed memory. He was a great many things. He was a Torah scholar of epic proportions. 
He was a Holocaust survivor. He was a soldier in Israel's War of Independence. He was the founder of what we call the Yeshivat Hesder movement, that is a movement to allow religious uh, boys to both study and serve in the Israeli army. And critically, he was a founder of a liberal religious party in Israel, Maimad. And when he was thinking and pondering and ruminating over the assassination of the late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, of blessed memory, he wrote the following about complexity. Complex thought, he asserted, is when people can understand that things which are obvious to them are not necessarily obvious to the other. And sometimes they are even completely unintelligible. In the absence of such an approach, statements about openness are simply meaningless. Furthermore, he suggests as a politician that when one appreciates the complexity of Israel's situation, then one is able to recognize the legitimacy of each political opinion. Over a decade and a half ago, he wrote that we have reached a situation where simplistic thought is increasing the polarization of society and leading to an inability to listen to others, to the extent of delegitimization of other opinions. The distance between delegitimization and demonization is not all that great, and we have unfortunately been witness to the dangers of demonization of the other opinion in the tragic assassination of a prime minister. Well, 15 years later, I can say yes and then some. We as a Jewish community cannot afford to fall into simplistic thought patterns and delegitimization of the other. That goes for how the right sees the left, and it goes for how the left sees the right. Otherwise, unity is a pipe dream. But let's get back to pride, because there actually is a third version of pride. There's a third way to think about pride, which is actually a pride that underrides all of our conversations and arguments about the conflict, and that's what I call pride of possession. It's a pride we don't focus on enough. It's pride in the fact that we have an Israel to argue about. We began tonight by asking whether we identify with Zionism because we are proud of Israel, or whether we're proud of Israel because we identify with it. I think we have to add another option. Are we proud to have an Israel to argue about, to identify with? Do we feel fortunate to have Israel in all of its complexity to be ours to be responsible for, to agonize over, to support and to challenge, ultimately ours to shape? And yes, I realize that I'm speaking to a room of diaspora Jews, but we have such a stake in this question and in these questions. Among the very psychologically astute saying of, sayings of our sages comes one found in the context of rotting fruit. When you're looking for holiness, you have to look everywhere. Take a look at page nine, number six. The case is as follows. I've left my home on a trip, and I've asked someone to watch my fruit for me as I'm gone. The Mishnah records, one who deposits fruits with a fellow for the latter to guard, even if the fruits are suffering a loss, the person guarding them cannot touch them. In other words, something's going wrong. And you, as the guarantor of my produce, of my possessions, they're, in your, they're under your responsibility. You're looking after them. What you think to yourself is, I'll sell them. Save Alana a financial loss. According to the Mishnah, you may not do so. And Rabbi Kahana explains why. Rabbi Kahana said in the Gemara, in the Talmudic passage, a person prefers one kav, that's a measurement of their own, 
to nine of their neighbor. Adam rotze bekav shelo mitishah kabin shel chavero. No one's comparing Israel to rotting fruit. But there's something psychologically astute in the notion that no matter where things are going, if I feel pride at the moment or not, in how Israel is choosing to comport itself, I feel pride in knowing that Israel is mine, that I have responsibility. And this sense of pride in turn gives me a stake and prompts me to have further responsibility. This is a pride that people on the right and on the left share. It's a pride we practically ignore because we take it for granted. It's the pride that we show when we come out to a Salute for Israel Day parade. It's the pride that we show when we make Yom Ha'atzma'ut celebrations across political spectra and across denominations. It's the pride that Rabbi Bukdal mentioned she can feel in this room. It's the pride of Israel being ours and Zionism being ours to think about and to grapple with. I asked a friend of mine why he was uprooting his family to move to Israel for just a year this year. And he said to me, because it seems to me that Jews have sovereignty over this land only every 2,000 years. And I want my children to experience that. A person would rather have their own fruit than someone else's fruit. And it's only when we start taking that fruit for granted that we forget that we share something. Yeah, it sounds very kumbaya. I know it sounds very kumbaya. It's dangerous, in fact. You know why it's dangerous? Because it applies equally to the crazies you agree with and the crazies you disagree with. But I have news for us. There are a lot of people who are not at those margins. And I'm sure I'll get a question of who are those margins. I know. But there is a middle. There's a middle that's fighting within itself and pretending that each is at the margin. You know, at the Shalom Hartman Institute, we talk about these three categories. We talk about pluralism. We talk about tolerance. We talk about deviance. Pluralism is when I say I disagree with you, but your perspective is equally valid. Not so easy to come by. Tolerance, I disagree with you. Your perspective is worse, but I tolerate you. Deviance, I don't even want to talk to you. You're a deviant. And by the way, even within that, there's tolerable deviance and there's intolerable deviance, right? There are plenty of people walking around our synagogues who might be tolerably deviant in one way or another. I'm not going to give examples, not only of people, but of actions. What I'm talking about is the tolerance section. We have very low tolerance. We have very low tolerance for people to the left of us. We have very low tolerance for the people to the right of us. George Carlin's old joke about the people going faster than I am are crazy and the people going slower than I am are crazy. That is the American Jewish community on Israel. And we can't be facile about it. I have to tell you personally, I come to this with my own baggage, with my own perspective. I was nurtured. I grew up on the first two senses of pride. Pride in accomplishment, at being able to defend ourselves, and pride that who could do this better? We're doing our best. And even though today, I'm pretty compelled by the notion that there's more work to do and improvements can and should be made. I still feel a great sense of pride. But I look to the community that nurtured that sense of pride and I say, you know, we have a problem. We have a problem because people on the right who have the first two senses of pride can't make room and aren't making room 
for people on the left to be able to bring the pride of their possession into the room and into the conversation. They aren't able to say, Israel is as much yours as it is mine. That's a big problem. It's a big problem for the future of Zionism in America. And for communities that I've only begun to understand in my adulthood, the more liberal, politically liberal perspective on the conflict, what I've seen is that education and marketing and unabashed pride of possession needs to be more of a focus. People don't connect to Israel because they like complexity. They don't connect to Israel because of cognition per se or because of always a sense of duty. People connect because they feel something, because they're emotional, because there's an affect. And the question I have for my fellow liberal Zionists, as I have for my fellow conservative Zionists, is how are we teaching pride of possession? Where are we focusing on that if we're so busy with the complexity? And so tonight, I humbly come to challenge both sides of this audience of the American Jewish world, humbly, to say we need to think about how our personal proclivities and what makes us feel good can be doing harm to the future of Zionism among Jewish communities in this country. And that's why I invite questions tonight. I'm not interested in putting some nice platitude before you or to wrapping something up in a bow. I'm interested in challenging. We, as an institute, are interested in challenging, in having people think about these things. And I'm very inspired and humbled that people were willing to come out tonight and continue to be willing to come out because you all know you're not going to get solutions here. But you do know that you're gonna get ways to think about and to frame the conflict. And what we did tonight is we said to ourselves, you know, before we assume I'm proud, I'm ashamed, let's look a little bit further into what that means. And all of you tonight sitting here, think about where you fall on this spectrum. What gives you pride? What alienates you? You can see, you can tell where I sit by my difficulty in saying shame about the state of Israel. But that's my personal proclivity. And where do we all find ourselves? And how can we talk to people who disagree with us and know that we hold the land and we hold the state in the same priority level, even if not on the same pedestal? Thank you very much. Am I supposed to move? Are we supposed to move? Thank you. Do we have to move the podium? Let's grab this phone. While the podium is being moved, I just want to note that the uh, Hartman Manhattan Collaborative Lecture Series is made possible through our ongoing partnership with UJA Federation of New York. So thank you, and thank you to the Legacy Heritage Fund for supporting this program. What he means to say is that I should have said that when I someone, started. Someone should have said it at the beginning. Someone should have said it. No, Rabbi Bookdahl said it. <laughs> I'm joking. Rabbi Bookdahl said it. <laughs> okay. Sir. I guess the thing that's, that I'm first sort of sitting with is you're talking, you talked a lot about the role that pride plays, and you definitely talked about pride as a liability. Uh, I guess I'm curious uh, where you see it as a is, it a, is it a productive force? Why wouldn't we just, here's the question, why wouldn't we just say, everyone should go home, think about their own pride and what they're proud of, and that's their own personal business, and try and look at the, you know, the, the, the facts as objectively as possible? Uh, or, or does, do we want to keep our pride as we engage with the issue? Okay, so let's clarify this pride of possession notion. Because the pride of possession notion is actually to get away from those first two types of pride and what we disagree about. Mm -hmm. Because I'm getting phone calls, we're getting phone calls as an organization from federations all around the country saying, we have no idea what to do about Israel. 
We don't know whether to support this or to support that, to say nothing, to say everything. There needs to be something that is a, you know, what I would call in Hebrew, a mechane mishutaf, something that connects Jews when it comes to Israel, when it comes to Zionism. And I don't think that is going to be the pride in the IDF soldier. And I don't think that that's going to be the pride in how are we doing? Because people disagree. But I do think that that can be the pride in, wait a second, for 2,000 years, we didn't have this. And for the first time, we have this. And I think that if educators would start thinking about how we are talking about that kind of pride, mm -hmm. instead of taking it for granted, I think we'd actually have an educational mission here. And why, why do you, I guess, why do you think that pride is essential, though? Why, 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 why do you think it has to be part of the solution? Because I think that emotions are really important. Uh -huh. I think that the question of how do I view self-preservation, how do I view justice, how do I view compromise, those are great abstract, important questions, and the best people to talk about them are Yossi klein Levy and Tal Becker and all the people you're going to hear from. But I'm talking about the kishkas. I'm talking about nachis. That's what I'm talking about. That's what's, you don't march in a parade because you say, I love the complexity of Israel, right? That's not what gets you. Right, but you talked about, let's say, your, your son earlier. My assumption is there's complexity in that love, correct? No, he's perfect. He's perfect? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -oh, anyway, I just so outed myself brother. as a parent to... So uh, is his little brother. He's perfect. <laughs> yeah. No, seriously. I mean, why, why, isn't it, why isn't it obviously... Because the level of complexity is reaching such a fever pitch for many liberal Zionists in our community uh -huh. that I think we need something else. Uh -huh. And, by the way, because the level of gap between right-side Zionists and left-side Zionists... I don't like wing. It sounds crazy. Right? right? It is... It's really getting too wide. It's really getting too so wide. So you're saying we need something together, and that, and you're suggesting that something being... We need something positive something together. Positive together. Not just soup kitchens. Those soup kitchens are good. Right. And Those why can't... Important. And then I'm going to get to your questions, but I figured since I'm the one with the mic, I might as well ask a few. Um, why can't it just be... This is the... This is the Whatever you think about Zionism or the state of Israel, it is the one of the most, objectively, one of the most remarkable things to ever happen in the history of the Jewish people. I'm not saying good or bad. I'm saying truly remarkable, right? The fact that random Europeans built the state that we have today in this amount of time is incredible, and it's our story. And why, is that, could that not be enough to just say, you know what? You don't get to choose between being proud of it or not proud of it. To be a Jew today, to ignore one of the major stories in the history of the Jewish people, is, let's say, to be, uh, to be negligent as a... <laughs> I think that there's an emotion, there's an affective element to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's our story if we claim it as our story. And what's going to want to make us, what's going to make us want to claim it as our story? Meaning, you're... So Keep American Jews today, there are American Jews today who are saying, you know what our story is? Our story is that our grandparents were immigrants, they came to this country, lifted themselves up by their bootstraps, and look at American Judaism, it's incredible. That's our story. How come our story is not French, Jew French Jewry? How mm -hmm. come we're not thinking about French Jewry? Because we don't need to. Because mm -hmm. we don't need to. American Jews don't need to think about Israel. Mm -hmm. They choose to think about Israel as their story. I agree with you that it is the most remarkable thing that has happened in the last I don't know how many years. Right. But there needs to be an emotional connection. And I really think what I said about pride and identity is true. That people's identity is in how they see themselves and whether they're happy about that or not. Right. So I, we can agree to disagree and it may be a, yeah. a sense of semantics, but I think that absent no, think the that, emotional I, relationship we have a problem. Good. All right, a question from the crowd. How can you expect to cultivate a pride of accomplishment in a younger generation when younger Jews do not have a positive historical experience with Israel? This is a good question. You may notice I didn't say that we should right. because I'm not sure how we can do that or whether we can do that. I think an important question to ask ourselves, and this is an honest question. I don't have the answer. I'm, I'm thinking about it with you is if, as generations pass, there is, by definition, a different lens through which each generation sees the world. 
And just like I, I'm not going to have my kid, you know, use a typewriter and think that that's an amazing technology, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to inculcate pride of accomplishment in the same way that I might feel it. That's not to say that I can't inculcate it and I can't focus on it and I can't talk about it and that should be part of our curricula, but we, we can't try to make the next generation in our image. It's not going to work and it's not going to speak to them. Are you worried that in our effort to turn shame into pride, we ignore or turn a blind eye to others' shame? I am not worried about turning a blind eye to others' shame because I really think that if we, if we can understand that the pride that I spoke about in the first two is not shared throughout the community, I think what we're doing is we're making, we're making space to say, Israel is yours, Israel is mine, and we can deeply disagree and feel shame, pride at the same things. I, I, I want that to be the case. Right. Now, I think we need that to be the case. How do we deal with the fact that when Israel communicates to us, it's not giving the same message to all of us in terms of who it belongs to and who it doesn't belong to? Well, I was thinking we could include Prime Minister Netanyahu yeah. as part of this series. Uh -huh. And you could all just ask your questions and have a conversation and see what happens. I... You know, when the, when the state was founded, so Ben-Gurion had like three groups to choose from in America who he could try to ally himself with. He had Americans who thought that there should be a diasporic Congress that helped make decisions for what went on in Israel, which if you think the Knesset is a disaster, just think about that. This is like the Tower of Babel on steroids, right? He had the American Jewish Committee, which was gung-ho Israel as Jewish project, but don't you dare tell American Jews to move to Israel because that upsets the integrity of the American Jewish community and also opens us to dual loyalty accusations. And then he had remnants of what used to be the dominant position of Reform Judaism, which was, this is not what our religion is about. What he chose was the middle position, right? He chose that middle position because he said to himself, well, you know, I can't, I can't have diaspora Jews ruling over what's going on here. And I think that that actually is the mindset today uh, in Israel. And I think that's understandable. Israel is its own country. At, you know, when you want to talk about Yiddish and Achis, imagine your child who knows that all of your hopes and dreams are riding on her and she's, you know, she's trying to become president, but it's just so hard to beat that Barack Obama, right? Just think about that person who's thinking like that. Israel has a little bit of that. And there's also a refusal to see that at the same time. And I don't think that we as an established Jewish community should necessarily be okay with that relationship. I think we can do more to tip that balance. I think we can do more say more, and I'm always in favor of saying things not in a strong-arming kind of way, but really trying to build some sort of alliance. Um, I, I think we can do it. So this is, I think, a really important question for you. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to the diaspora Jew who don't even express pride of possession, those who say that their Jewish values would be best expressed in a fully democratic not specific, not, not necessarily uh, Jewish Israel. How do you engender pride in non or anti or post Zionist? And, and I think it's actually, if I can have you focus on the, uh, the post and the non more than the anti. Sure, um, <laughs> I was waiting for this question. I was waiting for this question. I do think that there are parts of our community that do not share the pride of possession. And I understand that, and I don't think that we should pretend that everyone shares that. What I'm for is a more expanded middle. However, I think to myself about this whole Open Hillel conversation. Open Hillel, the conversation is not do we support Israel as an institution. We do. Not do we have an Israeli flag in our lobby. 
we do. Not do we support Jewish student groups and give funding to Jewish student groups that are post-Zionist or anti-Zionist. We don't. Can we have someone in the building who's part of an event who disagrees with the fundamental right of the state of Israel to exist? Jew or not? That's the question that's well, at issue. Can I actually say that it's not necessarily the question because I think you can, you mean exist as a, as a Jewish state, as a yes, Jewish yes, yes, and yes. democratic state. As a Jewish and democratic state. And yes. by Jewish we mean what Jewish means now to the state of Israel in some way. In some way. Jewish majority. Let's say Jewish majority. Let's right. say ethnic. Ethnically Jewish. Right. When I think about that question, I say to myself, you know, on the one hand, as a Jew in university, I would have been very, very unsettled walking into my Hillel, even with its Jewish flag, even with all its pro-Zionist stuff, seeing a, a forum like that. On the other hand, I don't really see what we accomplish in not being able to talk. I don't see it. I'm not trying to inculcate pride in anyone. I'm just trying to have a conversation with other people. I think that the danger of conversation, I think that's a mistake. I think things that we're able to, and this goes back to the generational issue and the generational shift. I think things that preserved us in the past may spell our doom in the present and in the future. I think we need to think long and hard about that. Um, as a student, I, I mean, I've seen it. I, I've seen the, the troubled committed say, you know, if the troubled committed can't talk to what I'll call the, the not committed, it's not, they're not committed to anything, it's that they're not committed to the Jewish state. As a Jewish state, they say, well, I, I, I don't understand. So there are only certain people I can talk to. How do we do that? How, how can we... That's not the world we live in. But pu pushing a little bit here, yeah. we, we are saying that, or you are saying, that... No, we, we even, can say it. That would be yeah, helpful, yeah. actually. Because I'll, whatever I'll, it is I'll decide whether like, I want to say what you say. Let's yeah. see. Um, Daniel said... <laughs> yeah. The, They're not laughing. This is not good. Uh -oh. yeah. We'll find out later. We'll, we'll, we'll read the tweets. Um, the... You're, you were, you're sort of proposing pride of possession as a, as a place we can rally around, but you're also admitting that there are certain people in the community who will not be able to rally around that. For sure. Okay. And I have no problem with that. I have no problem with that. I, I don't think that people don't have to draw their lines and can't draw their lines. I just don't understand a line that's drawn around non-talking to people. That, that makes very little sense to me. Um, draw a line around not supporting people, draw a line around not, you know, I don't know, not, not recruiting for their groups. Draw a line around that, but not talking. I, I don't see how that works in the 21st century. It doesn't, it doesn't make us look good, that's for sure. It doesn't make us look confident, that's for certain. I'm not scared of my very close friend who turned post-Zionist. I just totally disagree with her and really don't like her politics. Okay, nothing happened. I tried to get at this question before, but this is a, this is a little bit more detailed. So the question phrased this way is, what if our very being is discredited by Israel? As a reformed Jew, as a woman, as a convert, how can we feel pride of possession? Again, the way I, and, and I'll tie it to the question I asked before about what happens if Israel is communicating so I just want to say that I think we're in deep trouble on that question, and I think it's the right question. And what fascinates me is that what I see now happening in the organized American Jewish community is that there's actually, um, maybe behind closed doors, but there is a very persistent and consistent effort to try to inculcate religious pluralism in Israel. I think in some ways people think that's easier to do than to try to get political pluralism, American political pluralism into Israel. In other words, to get the Israeli government to meet with non-APAC Zionists, for example. I think that as a religious Jew, I find that critically important. I find that 
movement critically important? Because you know what? In 10 years, in 20 years, if as a reform rabbi, convert, woman, you can't have a stake in Israel, then you know whose fault that is? It's not your fault. That's a big problem. And that's why I think the American Jewish community needs to be doing more and is doing a lot already, again, whether publicly or behind closed doors, to have this conversation with powers that be in Israel. Because yes, yes you can't have a pride of possession if people, don't, people say it's not yours. Simple, very simple. And I would say that it's, uh, again, I, I, generally I don't love the right-left distinction, but I think here you do have a situation in which if, if the right of American Jewry and the voices in Israel are speaking with more of a same voice, and then you have the, let's say, diaspora left somewhere else, uh, that's even more of a problem in some sense, because then you, ha you do have alignment around Jewish values across the Atlantic, just not comprehensively. Oh, yes. I mean, I don't know if anybody read this article about intersectionality. People read this article? That, you know, one of the buzzwords, one of the issues that people are worried about is intersectionality, which is, you know, American Jews care about racial equality. American Jews fight for civil rights. That's what American Jews do. So if they fight for the rights of black Americans, why wouldn't they be fighting for the rights of Palestinians? And people say, intersectionality is dangerous. I said, saying that intersectionality is dangerous is dangerous. Do you expect people to have a split brain? They have to be able to express their feelings and values and have a conversation about these things with people who are actually in the know. And something that we actually try to do as an organization is we actually try to speak to the, the bifurcated right and left. We find ourselves, and it's a, it's a limited, it's limited, but we'll find ourselves speaking at a, a, J, a, a J Street conference and we'll find ourselves speaking at an APEC conference because what we're trying to tell people is we need to figure out a way that the alignment doesn't just go APAC, Lee Could, J Street, Labor. That's not good. It's bad on all accounts. It is bad, bad, bad. And we have a lot of work to do on that. We do. We have a lot of work to do on that. Um, another important question, and I think, you know, f what's interesting about this question, as you'll see, is it, uh, it mentions a group that hasn't been mentioned yet tonight as far as I think. I don't think the word Palestinian has been said yet tonight. Uh, and I said the word Palestinian. Okay, I missed it. Got it. Many times? One time, a few times, anyways. It has not been a focus of our, of our conversation, and I think that the, the, the very fact that we can have a deeply complex conversation without even like talking about the other party or one of the other key parties in the room uh, is pretty remarkable, but here's the question. Um, now we'll introduce it. Could you speak That one's gonna keep me up at night, you should know. Could you speak specifically about the occupation of a close to three million Palestinians, which to many of us is the greatest challenge to our pride in Israel? Sure. And I'm also going to fix it. I'm going to make everything better. And it's also all my fault. So just project all of it, the anger, the shame, the pride, just project it all right here. I was in Israel a few weeks ago, and I was, that's a good way to start, right? Because then I'm like very sympathetic character and I know what's going on. And I, I was talking to a friend and he said, he said, you know, a friend who lives in Jerusalem. And he said, you know what annoys me? What annoys me is my friends who came on Aliyah, who moved to Israel, and then they moved back to America. I said, why does that annoy you? So he said, it annoys me because they're not dedicated. He said, I want to end Palestinian suffering. I want to end occupation, but I'm going to continue working for it in some way. I think that there is a feeling, a preamble. I just want to say that the word occupation may not be legally accurate. I just want to say that for the record. That doesn't matter 
because the word occupation is the word that the world uses and the word that prime, most of the Jewish community uses. That, I want to make that decision. I'll, I can actually ask the question, though, important. without using it. And say, no, no, I want you to use yeah. it. I think it's important. Okay. But what I think is important for us to realize, and I'm not saying this is going to make us feel any better, but Jews in Israel who are of the more liberal persuasion feel just as helpless in that as we do sitting here in America. That says something to me. I don't know where we can go with it. I always say to people, if there's something you see that you want changed, go and support the organizations, the NGOs in Israel that are working on it. Go support the candidates who are working on it. Just for us to feel helpless here, that's a big mistake. Because every day of helplessness, first of all, doesn't help anyone. And second of all, it alienates us further and further. The only response that I have, literally the only response that I have, is that people who want to end the suffering of Palestinians have to work on it. They have to work with those who are working on it. It's a battle. Right. Well, the, I guess the question, though, is, is should it be more of a part of the communal narrative? Right? That's, that's the question. I think it's, that it's, as you bring in as you allow different sides of our community and different pieces of our community, it will naturally become more a part of the narrative. That's the point. What's happening now is that mainstream Jewish establishment is, is trying to keep it out. And you know what's a great way to get something to bust through the doors? Trying to lock it out, right? What we, what we need to do is we need to say, let's, let's have a real conversation about this. I don't want to see people standing with signs outside of the 96th Street subway that say, Jews against the occupation. That's not what I want to see. What I want to see is I want to see groups of Jews sitting around discussing this issue and saying, what do we want to do about it? What are we going to do about it? And what about, How what's the role of Palestinians in this conversation? That, I guess that would be my follow-up conversation, even in the intercommunal conversation. I'm not sure. I, my, my friend Yakir Englander, my colleague Yakir Englander um, of the Hartman Institute, he has a, um, an organization called Kids for Peace. He's very much on the front lines of these kinds of conversations and not being someone who is engaged enough in that conversation. I'm engaged in a conversation with Arab-Israeli citizens. I'm not engaged with Palestinians per se, so I actually can't answer the question honestly. I can't. Does it, does it concern you that we can have an event like this um, and say we're not familiar with that question? In other words, in other words do you, should we, yes. do we have a responsibility to? Yes. 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 I will say, again, this will keep me up at night. This will keep me up tonight, and I'm happy that it will keep me up tonight because it means I'll do something about it. One thing that I think is changing in terms of our generational narrative and the way we see things is the our side versus their side. To be honest, to be frank, that change to me is not without anxiety. I think there needs to be a certain degree of Jewish particularism in order to maintain identity. And because the world is not kumbaya and because sometimes the world is a zero-sum game. At the same time, I think the extreme of not knowing, as you say, and only knowing what I read in the newspapers and what I see on TV, et cetera, et cetera, I don't think that that bodes well for where we can go here. It's my honest answer. Great. Okay. Can you clarify the idea of chosenness? It is an often misunderstood concept, especially to non-Jews, who claim that Jewish people have a sense of entitlement with respect to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I wish there was alcohol in here. <laughs> there is alcohol in here. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me frame it a slightly different way, which yeah. is to say, for some people, the belief that God gave us this land is important, not important, it is it, right? And I would say I was educated in 12 years of schools that taught me that, right? Like that's the starting point. The Bible says, what do you do with that? That's how I'm going to rephrase it. 
That's a really good rephrase. Um, it's a little bit of a, um, it's a less meta rephrase in some ways. When I think about the question of ownership of the land, God gave this land to me, et cetera, et cetera, you know, I, I believe in those principles. I actually believe that Israel is the promised land for the Jewish people, and I believe that that is a divine promise. I don't take that lightly. But I really don't see how realpolitik can be totally discarded as a result of that. It, it, it is, that, that is nonsensical to me. I understand why people have a hard time giving away land because they believe that this land is ours and they want to hold on to it. I don't have an easy time with people saying, I can take someone else's land because it's really my land. I, 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 don't, I don't see the morality in that. I, I think that's a moral blind spot. I think that's a moral blind spot in our religious communities. I really do. I think we're taking one more. One more. Okay. And then you can all go watch the president do some unconventional state of the unioning or stating of the union. Okay. This is another sort of re rephrased version of a question I asked earlier, but maybe it'll get a, a different kind of response. When my child is a wonderful person and I am very proud of her and we are at the playground and she is a bully, should I not be ashamed of her actions? I should teach her. That's what I should do. I should give her the positive reinforcement that she needs, and I should tell her she is the apple of my eye, and I love her dearly, and I think we need to talk about how she's acting. That's what I should do. I don't give up my daughter or my son because he's a bully, because she's a bully. I don't give them up because of that. I never give them up. This is the sense of family that we need. We need this sense of family. And we need to feel it in both directions. What Daniel says about the way that Israel looks at American Jews, I can't solve that sitting here tonight. It's not just up to us. It's a dynamic. It's a partnership. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that people are starting to think about that on both sides of the ocean. So I want to end on an upbeat note. I believe in education. I believe in communication. And I believe that both of these things are the root to good in our future. And I hope that all of us take upon ourselves as ambassadors of Zionism to think like educators, to think like a family that wants to stay together. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.